one thing that's been coming up in our our group is you know people asking about negative self-talk or self-criticism and i know through our own life experience and our professional experiences we've all you know conquered that to some degree and it's something that we as humans deal with no matter what you know just based on our egos right <laughs> like on the daily and so i think it would be really great for us to talk about some strategies and maybe share some stories about what that looks like when we're talking about it in the veterinary setting as well as in life and what people can really do to reshape that so that they can get a handle on it and you know throw it in the back seat so that they can move forward right you guys think that's good wait wait a second did you say somebody's already conquered negative self-talk <laughs> well i mean I feel, like, I feel like i conquer it all the time you know oh but not like all together just like you know yeah, that's the thing, right? Is that it comes up because we're humans right. and we have egos. Right. But okay, okay. I'm with you. There's a way to, <clears throat> you know, to manage it. Yeah. I think I battle like, uh, I'm batting uh, like 50%. So, like 50% of the time, the negative self talk wins, and 50% of the time, I win. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, there's always that statistic that I talk about in a lot of my presentations, which is, you know, like, there we have upwards of you know 50,000 thoughts a day and they say about 90% of that is repetitive thought and then 50% of that is negative and so day after day you know we're churning through the same thoughts almost like a cow ruminating or something you know we're churning through the same thoughts and a lot of that is negative and so i think it's really powerful if you can be aware that you're even having the thoughts, right? That's always what mindfulness lets us do is just have a sense of awareness that, you know, I'm having this thought rather than, you know, getting swept away and really identifying with that thought. You know, one thing that you always talk about, Dr. Holly, is when you do a hundred spades right and everything goes fantastic and then you do another spade, like maybe it's right but there's a complication, right? Right, right, right. Like yep. everything. And so then you get like, am I, am I a bad vet? You know? Exactly. Or, and I, I see that all the time with, with vets all across the country, like even some of the top performing vets where they have one failure and then all of a sudden imposter syndrome, negative self-talk, like, am I, am I cut out for this? I even saw on a Facebook group once where a veterinarian was saying that she had a spay. They did the pre-surgical blood work, physical exam. Everything was perfectly fine. And then the puppy died during surgery. Like, oh, like that's like the worst thing that can happen, right? And she was debating leaving veterinary medicine. She'd only been in for a couple of years. But she was literally asking people in the Facebook group, yeah. should I bounce? Like, am I just not cut out for this? And I'm sure if she, she's a few years in that she's done lots of surgeries, probably seen lots of appointments and like so many things have probably gone right. But that one thing and she's questioning her her entire career. It's insane, right? Right, right. Um, no, it's not insane. Let me let me get to the, you know, from the <laughs> mental health side of the coin here and I'll kind of give you the, you know, the the not my take, but from the, uh, you know, the mental health professional side of the coin. What we're talking about, I think, are, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, cognitions, you know, negative cognitions. Uh, and a lot of times people can, you know, have negative cognitions or negative beliefs about themselves. And, you know, uh, uh, the example Dr. Holly uh, gave you know, I mean, that represents, that, that's kind of like a critical incident, like we've talked about in other, you know, uh, sessions here or other broadcasts mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, I mean, that's, that's a bad thing in the veterinary world. You have a puppy dies, you know, uh, people can have the perception, I lost the puppy, mm -hmm. first of all, you know, so once you get into that kind of thinking, uh, it, it, it adds a whole 
uh, you know, additional dimension to this. First of all, you know, I mean, assuming that you do the procedures right, you're doing things as, as you're supposed to do, and then the puppy in this case, or, you know, I mean, even with people, when you've got first responders, you know, I'd lost the person, I lost the puppy in this case. It's not really within our power, you know, we, we add a dimension of, of uh, assigning like a level of power that we don't really have. So, but if you take on this, you know, from the, I you know, you can just, that really adds more to the situation and puts it on a level of greater concern to the point where the person might be questioning their abilities. When somebody starts to question their abilities um, and that's, uh, you know, that's where peer support can be really helpful. Uh, you know, colleagues who say, well, you know, hey, we did the best we could, you know, but anyway, so we're going down this path a little bit of uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, where we get these negative cognitions, they can become very overpowering. And uh, uh, so the goal from the clinical side is to try to replace those negative beliefs with positive beliefs. I did the best I could, uh, you know, type of type of perspective. So that's just a little bit of that. And I, we could do a whole separate uh, yeah. discussion on this, but obviously we're not going to do that today. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. I think that's really powerful. I know um, we've talked a little bit in, like you said, other broadcasts, um, you know, I've had, I've experienced a lot of therapy myself and, and cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy early on in my career in my 20s and that was that was huge for me um you know I remember getting a book it was called uh, mind over mood and that was when I really started to understand that I as a like I Renee wasn't my thoughts you know and that the thoughts just were thoughts. Um, but that book, there's, it's like a workbook. Um, you know, you can actually go through and do these exercises that help you, you know, retrain. Absolutely. You know. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of techniques and, you know, methods to help people, you know, deal with, with these kind of situations. Some can be, you know, easily re, uh, resolved. Look, we, this brings us back to, you know, uh, you know, early childhood development and, and development as we, uh, not just early childhood development, but our, our upbringings. Mm -hmm. You know, if you live in, if you grew up in an environment, you meaning others, not you, Renee, sure. where, you know, if you grow up in a nurturing environment, you know, parent or parents are supportive and, oh, you know, you did your best and good job and, so on, you know, that's very supportive, as opposed to an environment that might, you know, where parents could potentially be critical or hypercritical, you know, where you get the perception that what you do is never good enough. So if you, if that's kind of the, undergirds a lot of a person's thinking, you can understand how it can really get magnified in situations like we're talking about, uh, you know, in the workplace, yeah, and in our personal lives, of course, too. And so, and so, Dr. Feldman, I wonder where where, where does tempered expectations uh, come into play here? Um, like, for example, uh, since I know we have some people from the sales team here, if you were going to be doing phone prospecting or any type of prospecting in general. And you were expecting to have a hundred percent of the people you reach out to to say yes to your product or to your sure. service, right? And then you have one out of every twenty or ten or sure. whatever number say yes, as opposed to a hundred percent. Then perhaps you're going to have some negative self talk. Whereas if you came into it understanding and realizing that. Sometimes people are just going to say, no, it's not you. It's not your product. It's not your service. It, it doesn't matter what you were offering at, at what price point, right. at what value point. Right. They were going to say no anyway. 
right? Sure. And so does that play a role? Because I'm just wondering for in the veterinary profession, a lot of my mentors, they, they, they sort of prepped me for everything's not going to go right 100% of the time. Sure. And so if I have a procedure that goes wrong, I can think back to my mentors who are already, um, who've already been down this road before and had things go wrong and explain, you know, how they handled that. Do you, do you think that could be something that would be useful to, um, you know, uh, new grads and, 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 and just veterinary professionals in general to understand that you, uh, you I, might in your career have one that er everything looks right and then it, it just something happens yeah i, I mean yeah. absolutely you you're uh, we've talked about this again kind of back in, into the critical incident world where we talk about uh, the phrase i'll use like pre-incident education mm. in other words mm -hmm. it, it can happen like you're gonna uh, it, it's for veterinarians uh, people in, in in this profession you know that not everything's going to work out 100%. You know, you're going to have to deal with losses. You're going to have to deal with tough situations and to kind of, and to somewhat inoculate people, you know, that's why I call pre-incident education, you know, in advance as part of one's education, um, you know, expectations, creating, you know, kind of create realistic expectations. So from the Salesforce perspective, um, you know, the recognition that you're not going to close every sale, you know, every phone call is not going to generate, you know, the positive results that you may be seeking. Um, and, you know, a kind of a caveat there that, you know, there are some people who can do well in that, uh, better in that environment than others. Uh, you know, I don't want to say you have to sort of thrive on rejection, uh, but, you know, has kind of in one's personality and their temperament that says, okay, this is job related. It's not, not personal. You know, I'm doing what I need to do. And Hey, unfortunately, I don't always get the, re I won't always get those results. So it gets back to, you know, yeah. again, preparing people right. uh, in, in training the sales force training as well should encompass, uh, you know, material related to what we're talking about. I, I love that. And it so sounds like there is an element of self-awareness that's vitally important here. It, because if you're the type of person who has thick skin, maybe from your childhood or upbringing, then maybe uh, if you're, if you're, I'm not going to say it, more emotionally stable, but if more you know, stress you, could, resistant. you can be more, more, more stress resilient. Yes. Yes. Stress resilient. That's, just, that's what it would be, right? That if you're more stress resilient, then maybe the, you, your pre-incident training doesn't have to be as robust as an individual who is not very stress resilient. And that's where I really think that we're coming from, from Get Motive at its perspective is you got to understand like where you are. Yeah. And if you're not very stress resilient, then you need to have lots of pre-incident stress training. And your uh, Renee and I, we did a presentation uh, for DVM 360 called uh, Creating a Robust Wellbeing Army. You know, uh, I forgot the, the sort of tagline to that, but we talked about three different phases of the, the difficulties of life in veterinary medicine, right? It, those are the things you can do before something bad happens. And I guess that would be the pre sort of incident stuff. And then there are the, the strategies that you have during a, an episode or an event when we're actually in battle, so to speak, like what are the, the tools and the strategies? And then how do you recover from a really difficult or tough day or um, a, a bad incident? And sort of having that self-awareness lets you know like how, uh, how, how hard you really need to go at it, in, in my opinion, because I feel like I am probably not very stress resilient uh, d just innately, but my preparation, like that bookshelf behind me there, like that, all those books are on, um, so, you know, just on how to uh, uh, maintain, prioritize and cultivate that well-being. Cause I understand that, you know, like this, is, this isn't something that I'm just naturally good at, you know, yeah. I'm afraid of my own shadow, but. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, I compare myself you know, compare myself, right? But, you know, with my significant other, right? Like we're pretty 
opposite end of the spectrum as it relates to stress resilience and, and necessities in your tool belt. You know, I have a whole, I've got like a whole Mac toolbox, you know, and he's like, what do you mean? Like, why, you know, I got this, like, I don't, I don't need all of these resources that, you know, you tend to, to go to, but that's because like you said, innately, I'm just, I'm prone to stress, you know, I'm wired for it. Um, and so, and I, I will admit in my, in my life, you know, like I had mentioned early on, I was much more prone to it. Now, thing, things have to be bigger for them to rock my boat, right? Early on, they could be very minuscule and it would cause a lot of boat rocking. You know, it's like, if I think about it, like a, a canoe out in the middle of the ocean versus, you know, now I feel like I'm like a ship or something that would be a little bit harder to move because I've done so much work in that area um, because it's just, I mean, it's like a roller coaster. If you know, it's like a roller coaster. If you have no handle on it, um, it can really, it can really, and you know, what's it's interesting about it is it bleeds over these other areas, right? Like, does this kind of resonate with you guys? Feel free to chime in, anyone. This is very informal and conversational, so we want to hear from you guys if this is resonating with you and how it shows up in your life, you know, if it bleeds over to, like, your home life or your personal life, conversations with your, your spouse or your parents or, and, you know, vice versa. And I'm curious to hear of any strategies that people use to... If, if you catch yourself in the negative self-talk, you know, how, how you um, o- overcome that. And I, I can share some of my strategies in, in a bit here, okay. the things that I do. Um, yeah. And what about for you, Dr. Feldman? Like, you know, does that, I mean, outside of, you know, because you, you've got, you've got the strategies, right? You know, just a human to human, does it come up for you? Like you ever think like, oh man, you know, uh, I could be better at, this or that, you know, or maybe it's something completely unrelated, you know, like, I don't know, changing the well, I, 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 you know, I mean, yes, yes, no, yes. I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to rein it in a little bit here. Um, Girl. And, uh, you know, it, it starts with, uh, obviously, we were talking earlier, really self-awareness, you know, trying to uh, be aware of our strengths and our weaknesses, or maybe not so maybe not weaknesses, but maybe areas where we may not be uh, as good. Um, you know, I'm, I've been accused of being a uh, somewhat of an overthinker at times, you know, and, uh, and, and that can work to my advantage at times. At other times, it can get a little bit, uh, you know, uh, challenging, but I rein it in, you know, I, 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 it doesn't get to the point of, of kind of full-blown, like obsessive compulsive behavior per se, or to the disorder, you know, reach that level. Um, so awareness is important. Um, and, and I think that we, as we talked earlier, kind of job matching, you know, what are we good at? What are we better at? Uh, you know, what, what might be, what might we be best suited for? So you know, we talk about stress management, different things we do to manage stress, handle our stress. The first thing is to recognize it, recognize when it's happening. Uh, I just want to add this, that, um, you know, as, as these things kind of start to spill over into our everyday functioning, and these things meaning, uh, you know, all the negative cognitions, negative beliefs start to affect our relationships, personal, professional, et cetera you know, I, I, I encourage people to get professional help. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we can do to kind of right the ship, but there are other things that, uh, you know, may be going on where we can benefit from, uh, you know, professional help. Um, and before we wrap up, I just want to leave people with kind of a, a, a you know, a piece of, a, a, as we were talking, negative beliefs, negative cognitions that might be helpful for them. So please remind me to recommend that, you know, to talk about that before we conclude. Um, but, you know, to Dr. Holly's point, he, he knows, he recognizes some of his, you know, some of the areas. Uh, you've mentioned it, Renee, and I, I think that self-awareness piece is important. It doesn't always, it doesn't necessarily happen automatically. 
sometimes we have to rely on feedback uh, from others, of course. Yeah, that's a really good point. One thing that helps me <clears throat> in particular is, um, for example, when I am, am at the hospital or, or at work at the clinic, doing a clinic, I try to, it, and it's not, not necessarily a good thing to have like wins and losses, but I understand the power of everything that I do so that uh, the, the, the things that are typically small and menial are, are actually meaningful to me. So, so for example, it's really easy if you're doing a, a vaccine clinic, for example, you're going to be giving probably uh, 150 vaccines in a day's time. Previously or prior to my sort of understanding of well-being and so all this stuff, I would just kind of view giving a vaccine. It's just a thing that I'm just doing, right? I'm just giving a vaccine, just giving a vaccine. Yeah, I know, I know it's important. Um, and things like that. But I actually ha have shifted my perspective to really looking at, you know, how deep and, and powerful the simple act of giving a vaccine is, right? If I'm giving a parvo vaccine to a puppy, then that's potentially life-saving for, for the pet, right? It potentially uh, saves the lives of other pets. If that dog doesn't get the parvo vaccine and it gets parvo and it's shedding parvo all in the environment and then other non-vaccinated puppies get into that environment and then they get parvo and then so i look at the, the the fact that i'm also building the human animal bond right so if i give the uh, vaccine and and it saves a puppy's life even though they never see that the puppy's life was saved i understand it as the the veterinary professional that the life was saved and that um, money was saved and that it, um, you know maybe i'm saving people thousands of dollars from uh, from ha having to do intensive care treatment for 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 the parvo virus, mm -hmm. and you see dogs come in with parvo, right? And the owners are stressed out, and sometimes the puppy does die, and sometimes they do spend thousands of dollars. And so, in essence, this small little menial act of me drawing up and you know reconstituting vaccine and then giving it to the puppy is actually m much more grand than than that and it also makes money for the, for the business <laughs> you know if you look at it from the business perspective even and it also gives me a job to do this so i can make some money and so there's a lot of things that really go into that and so when something negative happens if a dog does have a vaccine reaction or if a case doesn't go right or if there's a disgruntled client i have had all these little small wins throughout the day that have kind of kept me kept me sort of in the game uh whereas maybe if i didn't have that then maybe my i don't know my initial happiness level is down here or something like that and so i i, I, try, I try to find the 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 true and the deepest benefit possible i try to go seven levels deep right uh, um for everything that i'm doing in the hospital and it, and i don't always do it i don't always remember but when i do it, it's it's very effective mm -hmm. For, for me personally. I think that's awesome. You know, it's like you raise your threshold, you know, so that yeah, yeah. when things do come at you, you're already up here. It's like you're filling your tank, you know, almost like in five love languages when they talk about filling your tank, you know, right, um, right, 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 right. love and things like that. So you're right. you filling that tank. And, and I've seen the before and after resolve that. When I was working at that really busy practice where I was seeing 25 to 35 cases a day, and was just stressed out the entire day. I never viewed, you know, giving the vaccine as something that was so powerful, right? I was just doing it. It was like very, very mechanical. Like you wake up in the morning, check your email, <laughs> go brush your teeth. Like you're not really thinking about the fact that when you're 80, maybe you have teeth instead of false teeth because you brush your teeth, you know, every day, twice a day for the the, the 79 years prior or 75 or whatever. But um, yeah, so it, that's from that deep gratitude, right? Once you yeah. once you start to really practice gratitude consistently and make it that deeper gratitude, you can find it in these like stop and smell the roses sort of scenarios where things that people are taking for granted really become, like you said, meaningful and important to you, and it helps you shift your entire perspective, and it does help you raise your sense of well-being 
and your happiness and your fulfillment in your job. I yeah, mean, that's, that's important. It's important. In every aspect of it. Every now, aspect. It, so I have, I have a question for Dr. Feldman. Is, maybe this is a trick question. I don't even know, but is negative self-talk, is that normal or would you call it abnormal? Cause I feel like probably every human has it to some degree, unless you're like some super human, you know, narcissist. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends. Um, my, my favorite answer. Uh, let me kind of, you know, answer that by taking you through this little sort of, I mentioned an exercise earlier. Let me just kind of frame your question in, in, in light of, of this. So uh, it, it's what we call like ABC belief monitoring. Okay. So, you know, how do we get in touch with our thoughts? How do we know? Okay. Positive, negative, et cetera. So the ABC, A is like antecedent or slash like the trigger, okay? And I'm going to use the example of the puppy. And I may not be directly answering your question, but I wanted to try to, you know, narrow it down a little bit in this perspective. So uh, the antecedent or the trigger, uh, that represents, what was the situation, okay? So the situation, uh, using your earlier example, uh, a death of a puppy, you know, in the clinic or the hospital. Okay. So that was a situation. The B, uh, re relates to the, uh, uh, relates to belief and the thought. Okay. Um, sorry, I might've lost myself on camera, but that's okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see me or what, but I'll keep talking because I hope you can hear me. Um, the B yeah. is the, the belief slash thought. So it, from that perspective, uh, what thoughts or beliefs did, 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 you know, the person involved there have about the situation? You know, what kind of thoughts or beliefs did they have? Did they have the thought that like, oh my God, I lost the puppy. Uh, and then the, the second part of that is, is how true, uh, did that belief seem to you? Um, you know, like zero is not true at all. Uh, and, 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 uh, you know, hundred percent is absolutely true, you know, 0% not true at all. And hundred percent, absolutely true. So, um, you know, how realistic, so to speak, you know, what, uh, uh, was that belief? And then that kind of leads to the, 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 the C in the ABC, uh, mnemonic here is, how did you feel uh, when the situation happened? How did you feel? You know, what were the potential consequences? Made me feel terrible. I feel like I lost my faith in my ability, you know, to do, to do my work. I mean, I've heard people in situations where they question their faith, you know, depending on, again, the extent of what they're involved in, you know. Uh, uh, so, and also, how did you act? Uh, and, and how did others react? So, the, uh, the antecedent, the belief, and the consequences. So if others, for example, and consequences were, were saying, no, you did the best you could, you, you know, you tried, uh, you know, we couldn't have predicted this, or we didn't know this was going to happen, we didn't know maybe there was this uh, other condition, et cetera. That's where I talked about the peer support. So this is what we call belief monitoring, you know, and that's a kind of a simple exercise I think that people can do uh, potentially to help, or at least to, uh, to give them a greater understanding of what might be going on. Yeah. Uh, and this is just like one of, you know, an exercise that I would do with, with patients who, you know, are, are typically dealing with or struggling with a lot of negative beliefs, uh, uh, you know, low self-esteem, mm -hmm. uh, uh, poor self-confidence, things like that. Sure. So I, yeah. I didn't mention that. Yeah. So it, so it sounds like from this perspective that it's it's normal, right? You're going to have a thought or belief, and whether it's at zero or one hundred, it just kind of depends, right? But you're going to have the thought. So having the thoughts, yeah, is, I mean, is the pro thoughts are normal. Occur. Yeah, we, we don't want to deny them. I think what we're talking about, what can be worse, is is denying them or trying to stuff them, so yeah. to speak. 
-hmm. you know, stuff them inside, pretend we're not having them, put on a brave face, uh, you know, not the perception that we're showing weakness uh, if we get affected by these things. Right. But again, we're human beings. Right. We have emotions, we have reactions. Uh, and uh, I get more worried about people who, you know, tell me they don't have any negative reactions to situations that I know would evoke, uh, you know, negative reactions or certainly emo right. negative emotional right. reactions. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah, that reminds me a lot of, you know, the stop technique, you know, that we talk about in, in mindfulness is, you know, you're just taking notice, you're stopping what you're doing, you're taking a breath, you're taking notice of what's arising, because without being intentional with creating that space to do this exercise, you just go on about your day right? And maybe it starts to get a hold of you and you're not recognizing it. So you, you know, lash out on someone or you break down crying or something like that, right? Because you're not taking the space to really process what's coming up for you. And I think, especially in the workplace, you know, you know, we don't, we don't always give ourselves or our employees um, the space to process the human emotions that come up or um, we, we've actually heard a couple times that sometimes there are hospitals to do right we we've talked with a lot of hospitals over the year and there's some practice managers who you know it's common practice after you say uh, maybe you go through a euthanasia case and after that case it's very common practice that the people the team that was handling that case they walk around the building for 15 minutes you know, or they're able to just step away from the building for 15 minutes just to process that, um, which I think is a really great thing. But, you know, just it's like taking it in and, and being with it and then letting it go, because otherwise, like, like I said, it just kind of gets a hold of you and you're at the mercy of that versus shifting into this empowered mode where you can get out of victim mentality and get out of that negative mindset because you just have this awareness because once you're aware, that's when you can manage things. If you're not aware, then you can't do anything with it really, right? You're just at the, the reality, the reality is, you know, and you know me, I try to cut through some of the, you know, to, to maybe oversimplify at times, but to try to simplify and, you know, clearly overlap between mind, you know, with my, my mindfulness is great, you know, great tool. Yeah, uh, you know, great sets of tools that. Uh, sorry, that's my phone ringing right here. <laughs> it's a heck of a um, ringtone, man. <laughs> well, um, sorry. I'll, uh, someday I'll explain the reason. But um, <laughs> so the over. I, I'm sorry, maybe lose my train of thought here for a minute. I'm not going to let you the overlap to, like to mindfulness. That, you know, so. really good. You're simplifying. You're simplifying. Uh, good, good, good uh, tools to use. Um, and simplifying yeah you know so uh, people uh, who get who uh, in, uh, in the veterinary profession mm -hmm. they get involved because they want to help yeah. you know they want to help in this case animals you know they want to be helpers and you know helping owners helping the animals all that um, but I you know you've heard me preach uh, and emphasize many times the importance of taking care of yourselves you know, how do you do these things? How do you deal with these challenges? Uh, you know, essentially helping others without paying attention to helping yourselves. So we've been talking about different things, you know, mentioning them a little bit here and there about things that people can do, but in the courses that we've developed and we're working on, you know, that's we were, where we get, you know, much more in depth into, you know, coping with these things. Cause there's no just one thing you can do there's no one size fits all, um, but there are lots of things that people can do uh, to help make improvements in themselves so that they can continue to do the, you know, oftentimes challenging work that, that has to be done. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, have to be that way. Yeah, I, I love that. And uh, mm going much, much more in depth, like we do in those courses, right? We've got the one on stress and distress, three hours of 
talking about the different um, stressors and then talking about the different um, tools and tactics. That's just, such a great point there. You know, Renee, you mentioned something uh, that I, I that, that gives me a lot of hope for the veterinary community and the, and the veterinary profession mm -hmm. and the future of well-being for people. You mentioned how some practice managers and leaders, which we know is a very, very very small percentage of those practice managers and leaders, right, will actually have like different things in place for or if a team member goes through something. And it's so funny in, in my in my three years of working at the, the full service where I was seeing that heavy caseload and experienced just so, so many different traumatic things. If I really think back, and I've done this before, no one ever came to, you know, support, ask if I was okay, or, you know, to offer a resource. And it's so crazy to me that just, I was in that situation where I was burnt out, where I was struggling, where I did have unhealthy coping mechanisms and no external company came in, no third party came in to say, hey, this is a thing. There were no meetings about it, nothing, nothing. Yeah. Nothing, right? And how, how many times did I have a procedure to go wrong? How many times did something come in already circling the drain? How many times did owner, owners hand me their dog? Like, fix it. And I'm like, it's already dead. You know what I mean? Like, that's right. the, the type of thing that we're dealing with. Yeah. And most places, we already know this, which is why we created Get Motivated in the first place, right? is to say, hey, like, there's at least something out there. If this is you, we try to describe it, try to describe it in a, in a way that it'll resonate with people to say, wow, I actually am going through this. This is something that I've experienced and I'm not doing anything. I didn't even know there was something to do. Um, yeah. And so that's, 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 yeah. that's so important. Um, and, so, and so I'm really, I'm really excited because when the profession, when, when, the, when the tipping point comes where, it's the rule and not the exception to have a well-being program where it, this is just the norm, right? To have conversations like this, this is just the norm where people are, they do feel, as Dr. Feldman would say, confident and competent in, in, in some of these you know, basic things, then we know that, that things will look much better. And uh, you know, yeah. I'm excited. I think you're I think you're spot on. And I know Dr. Feldman has talked about it before as far as industries. You know, the we'll say the challenges that the veterinary profession faces are not unique to the industry, but as far as the response, we are seeing a better response as far as uh, adoption of these, you know, practices or initiatives, programs, things like that. Um, and that, that you're right, you know, that was the one thing for me when I moved from Michigan to North Carolina and never quite found that home again. Um, you know, I spent 11 years in my first practice with very, I will, I'd like to, you know, they're very, they're like light workers, you know, they helped me learn how to be a leader and helped me in this type of training, you know, the, the personal aspect of what our jobs entail. Um, but it, it was hard to find another place like that. Um, and so I think you're right. And I, we're, we're already seeing it, you know, we've we're already seen it in the past few years that get motivated has existed, that there is, you know, there's, there's the early adopters, if you will, who mm -hmm. they believe in this and they're acting on that and they're, put, they're putting it into a priority category. And so it's, and it's shaping their missions, it's shaping their business metrics, it's shaping their day-to-day, -day, their team culture. Um, and so I, I, you're right, 100%. But it's, you know, as we talked about before, as the industry as a whole, it's a big ship to turn. And so um, I'm, you know, I'm happy to be in this as far as the solutions for people go. Um, right. And, and one thing I want to mention too is in terms of uh, ways that I cope with the negative self-talk. Yeah. I think that the, the last thing I'll share is, and we talked about this in a presentation that we did with for DVM 360, right? It has having a robust mm -hmm. support network support system. As Dr. Feldman already alluded to this, I just want to emphasize it 
um, that it, having colleagues, and not just any colleague, but colleagues who are somewhat on the same plane in terms of, of well-being and, and, and being uplifting, because sometimes colleagues can give you probably something that you didn't need or that it makes things worse, right? Just get over it. If you go to the wrong colleague, that's what they're going to tell you, like suck it up. And, you know, some people maybe need that, but some people not. Um, but, you know, my wife, for example, she got a bad review for her mobile practice, <laughs> um, you know, like maybe a week and a half ago. And it turns out it was for the wrong mobile practice. It wasn't even hers. But she was beating herself up so badly. And, and it, 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 I think it was good for her to, she, she actually went to a Facebook group, I think Moms with the DVM uh, Facebook group. And, you know, people were giving her really uplifting information. She had me to be like, you're the best vet in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Like, come on, yeah. you know, so, you know to, to have things like that and to talk about and to remind her of all the good things and, and all the good reviews that she's had. But imagine if you just don't have that support, if you don't have those people to reassure you that like, it, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a bad thing. I understand it hurts, you know, but you're the bomb, you know, like to, 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 to do those types of things is really important. And when I look at the support network that I have in terms of business, because business can be tough or sales can be tough or veterinary medicine can be tough. It's just so important to have those mentors, right. Who can tell you the stories and, um, and, and it's just yeah. be there, just be there for you. Important. I get, I, I was just reminded of something, um, you know, and, and, and I, I, I try to avoid making like general statements about society and, you know, in reality though, you know, kind of as a general statement, we can, we, we can be very judgmental, you know, our society, very judgmental of others and, and so on. Um, and, you know, I learned early on in my career, well, maybe not so early on, uh, I, I read this quote somewhere, and that is that people will scream your failures and whisper your successes. And, uh, you know, when I started to kind of incorporate that thinking, uh, and it was apparent, you know, in my, in my career, you know, working at a large, uh, you know, medical school and hospital system, uh, you know, and colleagues, maybe colleagues, maybe not colleagues, you know, but just that, that kind of uh, having that perspective, you know, realizing that and, and, um, and that we can't be perfect, you know, we will make mistakes, uh, as, as we were talking about earlier. Um, and, it, it, and, and to your point about your, you know, your wife's comment, you, you know, reading that, um, that will oftentimes get more like complaints than positive feedback. For some reason, that's human nature, a little more of human nature in that respect. So important to keep those things, uh, uh, you know, in, in proper perspective. And I'll share this other thing with you is that, uh, I've done a lot of training and teaching over my career and, you know, and I would, when I first started, I'd sit down, I get these evaluations and, you know, you get a stack of evaluations and I'd read through these evaluations and I would, you know, anytime, if someone had some kind of a negative comment, um, that I, you know, if you're going to give me a negative comment, all right, let me know why, you know, don't just critique it. So, but I learned over time, again, that you can't please everybody. Uh, so I, I typically now I, I sit down with a glass of wine, I look at the evaluations, you know, and I just say, wow, this is interesting. This person was unhappy with me giving, you know, uh, case examples. And then again, you know, here's a whole stack of evaluations. It says, oh, we love the case examples. So, right. you know, Frank, yeah, just yeah. balance those things. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but to your point, unfortunately, too many organizations do not, uh, you know, just provide some uh, positive comments. Mm -hmm. uh, like, hey, good job. Well, that was a tough yeah. situation. You did the best you can, as opposed to, you know, more the negative kind of comments that we were alluding to. You know, 
and to your guys' point, so we, we had a case a few years ago here that there was uh, a doctor in the area who was, we'll say, the victim of, of cyberbullying. Uh, a negative comment went viral, and it got to the point where the clinic had to close because of the public's, um, you know, what was happening. And I, I won't go into it, but it was really, it escalated very quickly within 24 hours. Um, and so I think that that's something we kind of, you know, it's this new age thing where that wasn't, that wasn't a thing 15, 20 years ago. Now everyone can jump on the bandwagon virtually and, and really knock someone down. Um, and your comment <laughs> reminded me of Brene Brown when she writes about um, being in the arena. You know, she references Teddy Roosevelt and people when they shout your failures, oftentimes they're not even in the arena. You know, it's not like it's another veterinary professional saying that you might have done a bad job, but it's someone who's completely not in the arena and their perception is that you didn't do a great job. And so, you know, when we see this in other industries, like, you know, maybe my guy who's a graphic designer, he might have someone who, who's out of the industry critique uh, the placement of something. But what they fail to realize is that there's a curvature of the vehicle that, you know, doesn't come up to the to, to an untrained eye. And so, you know, we're getting feedback from people who are not trained professionals. They have a perception that the incision isn't pretty, but it's completely functional, you know, because it's not pretty, right? Um, and so that's something for us to really keep in mind too. So I think both of those points are um, really important when we're looking at modern medicine today and what the industry that we're in. But I also wanted to remind you, Dr. Feldman, that you wanted to share something in particular before we jumped off. And I know we're coming close to the hour. Yeah, I, I, I kind of already did that. And okay. it, was just, it was really just that the, uh, the ABC belief monitoring okay. kind of That's exercise. Okay. Yeah. That, that, so, I, I, sure. so I wouldn't forget. And thank you for reminding me. But I inserted it a little earlier uh, yeah. as I was talking. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that today. Because I'm sure something's going to go. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have some type of incident, probably, right? Where I'm having some negative self talk, something like that. But I wanted to say, you know, really quickly um, criticism from others, like what other people say and what other people think. They've been mentioned as the 10 most dangerous words in yeah. the human language, right? What will other people say? What will other people think, right? And I think to tie that back to what we're talking about in this conversation, if that translates, over to negative self-talk man that, that is so powerful because because there will always be the the criticism and the thoughts and opinions of others you can go to youtube and find the most positive powerful just like educational youtube video and it'll have if it has a million likes it'll have at least three thousand dislikes and it's like what could you dislike about what was just said here in this person and whether it's bots or spam or whatever i don't know but if you allow those 1000 or 3000 to get to you mm -hmm. maybe it'll discourage you from putting forward your 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 best information i know as, as a speaker since i'm i'm not i'm not uh, um, you know that was not what my education was necessarily that i've had a lot of moments like that yeah. but the important thing is just to push forward and just to continue to remind yourself that it's your purpose to to do whatever it is to do. It's your purpose to treat animals. It's your purpose to uh, to provide a product or service for you know for your clients and uh, and just to continue to move forward. Man, that's that's the most, that's, that's the best that I've got for you today. So just continue to push forward. Yeah, and you can really empower yourself, right? Like if there's a skill that you really need to develop you can develop that skill. Um, but if it's just something, you know, we'll say as simple and simple is not, is overly simplifying it, but something like mom guilt, you know, if you're feeling guilty about that, you know, really working through that with, with the model that Dr. Feldman shared, I think can just free us. Really, we're just trying to free ourselves of the chains that we put on, put on ourselves. You know, sometimes we're, we're our own worst enemy. And so yeah. um, I think this has been a great conversation. I, you know, I'm glad that we have really good, tangible take-homes for people to apply. 
And again, you know, I'll put those things that we talked about in the resources section on Get Motivated University so that people can, you know, work through those things. Um, I, I see people jumping off because they probably have uh, 11 o'clock or things like that. But any comments from any of our, our guests today? And, and thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks for attending. Any thoughts, comments? Excellent. Excellent. Well, if you have, have anything, feel free to email us or to join us in, in a couple of weeks. We'll be back here again for another session. And then, um, Renee, maybe we can send out some, some emails about what, what the next topic is going to be. Sure. Thanks for coming. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you, you both You're for welcome, Stephen. Yeah, thank you so much, you guys. Take care. All right. Thanks, Dr. Film. Bye, everyone.